it, it's hard to explain. I mean, if, if you haven't experienced like untracked bottomless powder skiing, I can't really, I, nothing I can say can do it justice. Uh, it's, it's an addictive experience. I enjoy the, the physical aspect of earning my turn. My name is Seamus Dolan. I live in the Salt Lake City area in Utah. And I would I'd really describe myself as someone who's just passionate about playing outside. And the people who've gotten to know me the last few years of my life probably know me more for the skiing and, and my passion for backcountry skiing. But there's, there's a lot of things that I'm passionate about. I didn't grow up in Utah. I grew up in central Wisconsin. So mountains were not a big part of my life growing up. Um, you know, I just I had a pretty standard Midwest childhood. You know, I just I did sports in high school. I, I always had a fit athletic background, but the 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 getting into this mountain lifestyle came sort of at, near the end of college and and then after college. Um, but I mean, just some other things that I'm I'm really passionate about uh, are like severe weather. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, my dream was to have like a tornado chasing TV show. Maybe that'll still happen someday. We'll see. And then late high school and early years of college, I was really passionate about water skiing, like barefoot water skiing, slalom water skiing. Um, and I still watch professional ski tournaments whenever they are happening. Later in college, I was I got into CrossFit and that played a pretty significant role in my life. I, I, I went through a couple rough years in college and, and getting into CrossFit was was very helpful for me. And then after college is when I moved to Salt Lake, but I, I've always loved skiing and, and, and I've always loved the mountains. People don't think of it. Wisconsin is not a mountainous state, but it is a ski state. Uh, it has the third most ski areas of any state in the U.S. Only Michigan and New York have more ski areas. And the Midwest produces a lot of very talented park skiers. So there is a ski culture in Wisconsin. And then I grew up going to northern Vermont. My mom's side of the family has a place on a lake up there. And I grew up hiking those smaller mountains around the lake. And I've always loved that. And the first bigger peak that I hiked uh, was Mount Washington in New Hampshire. And I think I was around 10 years old. My dad took me and, and three of my other brothers to go hike Mount Washington. And I'm pretty sure I was the only one who enjoyed it. <laughs> and um, every year, like the rest of my childhood, I was always asking to go back to Mount Washington when we were in Vermont and nobody wanted to do it with me. And then, you know, since, you know, I, you know, like college and my young adult years, I've since um, summited Mount Washington another half dozen times and a couple times, a couple times with skis. As I like during COVID, I sort of discovered the world of backcountry skiing, mainly through YouTube. And I, you know, I'd see these people on YouTube and I would think, I like hiking and I like skiing. I think I would like that. And I bought my first touring setup during the 2020, 2021 season. Um, you know, my first ski tours were done on the East Coast. And then I moved to Salt Lake in the spring of 2021 and, and sort of the rest is history there as I've lived here and, and sort of just thrown myself headfirst into the world of, of backcountry skiing and ski mountaineering. That's great. I did not know that Michigan had the most ski hills and I live in Michigan. So that's, well, you know, what's funny is before this, I thought Wisconsin had the most and I Googled that to verify that before I made that claim. And it turns out Wisconsin has the third most like, uh, and then Michigan has a handful more ski areas than Wisconsin. Then New York has way more than Michigan and any, and any other state. But it's funny because like these two states in the upper Midwest actually have far more ski areas than any of the Western U.S. states. I think Colorado is not far behind, but uh, Utah does not have a lot of ski areas, um, even though you associate Salt Lake City as this like world class ski destination mm -hmm. you know the, the ski areas are, are the ski areas are limited to a few areas um but most of the mountain ranges in utah are, are more or less untouched when you get away from the cottonwood canyons and park city and if you're if you're listening to this thinking you want to come to the midwest to ski i would not recommend it i, I think we're just larping we we take garbage piles and turn them into ski resorts and uh quote unquote ski resorts and, yeah, uh, well, you know, the thing with the Midwest is, is I mentioned that the Midwest produces a lot of very talented park skiers. Like mm -hmm. you don't need a lot of elevate, you don't need a lot of vertical and you don't need natural snow to make really good terrain parks. As long as it's cold enough to make snow, 
then you can shape it the way you want. And and the, the Midwestern ski resorts have really phenomenal terrain parks. And a lot of the best park skiers in the world come out of, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, because there's nothing. That's the one thing they can do really well in the Midwest is make terrain parks. Yeah, you're giving me a lot of a lot of context here that I didn't even know about. I will say that if you and I know you said you haven't gone here, but Mount Bohemia in in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan is unreal, and it, it's weird. I don't even know how to can can like contextualize it, but I would compare a Denver, you know, Colorado ski hill to Mount Bohemia. And it doesn't have the same altitude, but it's all backcountry. It's all ungroomed. Um, I guess I don't know if I'd call that backcountry, but it's all ungroomed. And there are backcountry portions. Right. Uh, I don't know. It's just, it's so much cheaper. I think it's a huge part of it. You get this like really cool local community vibe yep. for like a fraction of the price compared to what you're spending out in Utah and Colorado. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's, that's great. I, I like that that background that you gave about how you got into hiking and everything. Now you live in a state that has good skiing. Do you still go to the ski parks out there, the resorts and everything? I skied at the resorts my first two seasons living here. Um, you know, the first full season I was here in, in Utah was 2021 and 2022. And I had, you know, I had a pass, I had the icon pass and I, you know, I did a lot of skiing in the Cottonwood Canyons. Um, in that season, we had a dry spell in the middle of the winter that lasted almost two months, like January and February of 2022, we got almost no snow and the conditions were, you know, not very good, but, um, you know, it was good to have the, resort pass to go ski resorts during that dry spell and work on my downhill skiing. And it was also a good time to learn, do some learning in the back country as the avalanche danger was really low because it didn't snow for almost two months. So I was doing a lot of backcountry skiing then too, and getting into avalanche terrain in, in conditions that were more or less safe from avalanches. Um, so that season was an interesting one because we had like a, a type of dry spell you just don't see in Utah. Um, and it allowed for, me to get out in avalanche train as i was still in this very green phase of of my this journey of learning to, to explore the mountains on skis um so i skied maybe 20 days in the resorts uh that season and then another 60 or 65 days in the back country my second season here i got the mountain collective pass because i was starting to think like you know, when I moved to Utah, I thought I would ski like two thirds resort, one third backcountry, and it ended up being the other way around. So then my second season, I was thinking like, I definitely want to pass just for the days where the avalanche danger is really high um, to keep me occupied. And I'm going to really start focusing on, you know, becoming a more proficient backcountry skier. That was a 2022, 2023 season. And I don't know how much you heard about that season. I'll never experience a season like that again in my life. We got 900 inches of snow in the Cottonwood Canyons. I was skiing stupid deep powder almost every day. Uh, <laughs> and I, I skied probably 10 days, 10 or 12 days at the resorts that year, and uh, another 125 days in the backcountry. I mean, it was just the most ridiculous ski experience ever. Um, and then last season was my third full season here in Utah, and I didn't even get a pass. I was like, I've, I, I, was familiar enough with the Wasatch, the central Wasatch to be like, I, I know where to go when avalanche danger is higher. And I had the fitness to go to any zone I want. Um, and so I didn't get a pass last season at all. I just skied in the back country and I had a fantastic season. Um, there were some periods of the season that were very sketchy. Uh, and I would have liked to have had a resort pass, particularly like mid January. Um, but, you know, we, I managed, you know, I, I just went to sort of like the, the, the zones that you ski when avalanche danger is higher. And I spent a lot more time in those zones than maybe I would have liked, but it was still a good time. Um, so, yeah, I skied, you know, a decent amount in the resorts my first couple seasons here. But each season has been less and less resort skiing and more and more backcountry skiing up to the point of last season where I didn't do any resort days. So what is it about the backcountry skiing that, that you prefer over the resort? Well, 
the resorts are getting crowded. I mean, you read about this on the internet. Uh, the traffic is, you know, the kind of the rush rush hour ski traffic. You know, that hour before the lift starts spinning, and the the two hours after the lift starts spinning. You know, the traffic is is terrible. The lines. You know, you might wait fifteen minutes in a in a line to get on a lift. And I'm not a patient person. Patience is not one of my virtues. And I, you know, 2023, you know, I got the real Utah untracked powder experience because we got so much snow. And skiing untracked powder is, is it's just an experience that tops anything you can experience in the resort, in my opinion. Um, and I'm willing to hike uphill to go experience that. Um, because in the resorts, like you have a, a 20 inch powder day within the first hour, it's tracked out. And that's fine. Like there are, you know, like a, a spring powder day when the lines are not as long is as fun as I've ever had skiing. You know, my bet, my, my most fun ski days ever are actually resort days, like late spring at Jackson hole and Alta ski area. When most people have put their ski things away for the season, then you have a late season storm come in right before the resorts close for the year. That's actually, you know, as about as fun as it gets, um, where you can ski untracked powder inbounds, but, um, it's hard to explain. I mean, if, if you haven't experienced like untracked bottomless powder skiing, I can't really, uh, nothing I can say can do it justice. Uh, it's, it's an addictive experience. And, um, I, you know, I have the fitness. I enjoy the, the physical aspect of earning my turns. Like, I, like hiking uphill for hours at a time or even just an hour at a time if I'm doing laps, like it's not an unpleasant experience for me. Like I, I, I actually don't mind it at all. And I, I think having a lot of fitness helps with that. And, you know, I've, I've done it for enough years now that I, I know when to call it, when to call it a day. Um, Cause I always want to have enough energy in the tank to go and ski the next day if conditions are good. Um, I, I'm rarely like emptying the tank in the back country, mainly because it's unsafe to do that. If, if you ski to the point where you're just completely trashed and that's when your judgment becomes impaired and that's, that's when things go wrong. But you know, I, like I said, like, I like the uphill. I enjoy the uphill, especially if I have good company and you're having good conversation with your ski partners, like the uphill does not have to be this miserable experience of just like slogging until you can get to the line. And if you're, you know, it, but it's ultimately worth it to experience that like you, you find a line that's untracked and you drop in and you, you, you're just like floating. And that's, that's like how I would describe that. Like why I um, prefer the backcountry over the resorts. But aside from that, it's also more adventurous. You know, you can use mm -hmm. skis to explore all these different mountains that get enough snow to ski and it's a cool way of climbing mountains like with skis on your back in the winter and the spring and then skiing down is just like the fun way to go down the mountains in my opinion like i'm at the point honestly where i don't even climb a lot of mountains in the summer because i don't want to walk down <laughs> because skiing down is just so superior <laughs> There's a few <laughs> things I want to take from this. It's it's as you said, it's hard to quantify or explain why powder is so addictive, right? And I, I think that's yeah. what I liked about Mount Bohemia is that you can go so far, you know, down the mountain or across the mountain and find these trails that nobody's touched. Uh, they always name things after like Lord of the Rings, so you go find like I don't know Gandalf or Frodo or, or those trails or whatever, and typically they're they're not touched, and those are the best areas to to be. And you know we also don't have the altitude, so half the time you're getting stuck and stuff. But right. that's that's the fun. You just get to delatch because I snowboard, and then just like hike out of it and see the stuff that nobody else gets to see. And then uh, I've actually had one backcountry experience, and this was at Loveland Pass in Colorado. My brother-in-law, he used to live out there. And he was like a broke, broke, just out of college student. And that was his favorite place. He would just go to the bottom, hitchhike up to the top of this, this pass, which was totally insane because you get these people that are so comfortable driving in the winter that they're ripping around these corners and one wrong move. And they're going to throw you and everybody in the truck bed off this cliff. Mm -hmm. But we just trusted it. We didn't care. We got to the top and then you hike the ridge out to whatever spot you want to go to. 
and you go down. And yeah, I remember being totally out of shape, not used to the altitude, and just huffing and puffing trying to get to the peak that he wanted to ride down. That's exactly my first backcountry experience. Um, you know, I did a spring break trip to Colorado in, in 2020. COVID totally screwed up our trip. The resorts closed the day we got there. So the next day, we just did shuttle laps at Loveland Pass. Uh, you know, I was totally not equipped for any sort of backcountry skiing. We had, we don't know about the avalanche danger there. Granted, like mid-March, the avalanche danger kind of settles out uh, most years, even in Colorado. Um so it probably wasn't particularly dangerous, but it, I do remember it being warm and the, the snow getting kind of wet. It's like if you're on a, a steep south facing slope, that, that could turn out to be dangerous. But, uh, it, you know, like everybody was doing it like, you know, if something would have gone wrong, there was a bunch of people around that could have helped out. Um, but it's just part of the it's just part of the experience. I think the reality is like, you know, most people get away with maybe not so safe decisions in the, in the back country. It, it's, it's when you get caught where things can go really terribly wrong. Like it's not a forgiving learning environment when things do go wrong. And for, but also the thing is like most people who get themselves in trouble in the back country are usually experienced people who know they're pushing it and they know they're taking a risk and they just get bit because people who are just getting into back country skiing usually are sticking to mellower terrain and, especially if you take an avalanche level one before you get into backcountry skiing, you've probably had it drilled into your mind how dangerous avalanche train is. So you don't see really inexperienced people getting into a lot of trouble because they tend to be on, you know, chiller terrain. Um, the exception to that is when people go out of bounds at ski resorts in Colorado. Um, there's a lot of resorts in Colorado that are bordering avalanche terrain and Colorado is notorious for having, um, sketchy avalanche conditions, particularly like December, January, February. And then, it, you know, sometimes March, it just depends on the season. But you, the Colorado snowpack doesn't usually settle and become safe until later in the spring. There's so much of the avalanche stuff that I could get into. We had a, because I don't understand it. We had a guy on, I think it was Shane, who said he actually, his buddy got caught in an avalanche and he he finished doing the run. He hears like a twang or something, looks up the hill. And it's it's his uh, it was either the crack of the no it was his uh, balloon going off right and just yeah. like echoing echoing through the mountain pass and yeah he was able to outrun it and just like dip to the side no issues but it's just like it's terrifying and I I mean I I have no idea if we were at risk or anything when we went to Loveland Pass but we went far out to one of the peaks and had a little little bit of snow kind of fall off the top that could have started something. Yeah, I mean, you tell me what time of the year you were there. I could probably tell you what kind of risk you were in. It was probably February. Yeah, that's February. a that's still a sketchy time. If you're <laughs> like, if you're on a steep enough slope to slide, you sh you want to watch your back in February in Colorado. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, so you're doing. You said you kind of dropped off hiking, and I haven't done a lot of winter hiking. I know that you can on some mountains. You can hike pretty much see no no snow until you get towards the peak and then you still have right. that opportunity to do a run uh you know down the snow face but it sounds like you're doing a lot of your stuff in the winter um but you've also done loveland so i'm, I'm kind of curious what the different i don't know backcountry styles there are there's like hitchhiking there's there's uh hiking um and i'm also curious like what what goes into hiking in the snow to make it so you're not just like dredging well i mean the only two ways you, you you should hike in the snow are with snowshoes or with skis. And, um, you know, skiing, ski, backcountry skiing, like ski touring is far more efficient. Um, you have more surface area. And because the ski is long, you can glide uphill and then the snow settles underneath your ski when you walk uphill. Whereas, you know, snowshoes aren't long enough to, to have that gliding motion. So you, you kind of, you, you still have that kind of that trudging motion. And it keeps you on top of the snow, but it's not an efficient way to move. So you kind of need to be an, an expert level skier to safely travel through the mountains in the winter on skis, because even if it's low angle terrain, you can find hazards that you might need to maneuver around or ski around that might require some sort of like expert level ski move. If, if you're not, uh, 
Like if you're if if you're just wanting to go like hike in the mountains in the snow and you don't have a, a fairly um, robust ski experience of skiing, then it's safer to go with snowshoes. It's slower, it's less efficient, but it is safer to go with snowshoes. Um, but you know, as someone who grew up skiing the little you know ski hills in the Midwest. I, um, you know, I have a long history of skiing, and and then I moved to you know, Salt Lake, where I was able to really improve my skiing quite fast, and also having the fitness to to move uphill quickly on skis. Uh, you know, in in the snow, um, it's 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 just more natural for me to take skis, even if the snow conditions are not are not very good, because I know I can you know safely you know get down whatever I climbed up on skis and more efficiently than with snowshoes but it just it comes down to how comfortable are you on skis like are you a, a solid skier or and um like what are your what are your goals for hiking in the snow um because if you're you know it's like some some terrain is just better to ski down than to walk down especially once you get to, to steeper slopes um if it's like fairly flat then there's not as much advantage to skis other than just the efficiency of the movement because you're not going to be that much faster um, on skis if you're, you know, trudging through powder on a, on a on flat terrain. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's it, there's no, like, black and white answer to, like, what's better, skis or snowshoes. I've never used snowshoes uh, because I've always loved skiing, and I specifically moved out to Utah because I wanted to get in more into big mountain skiing and backcountry skiing. That's the whole reason I moved here. So, you know, I, I just, if, if, if there's enough snow to ski, I'm going to, I'm going to take the skis. And if there's not enough snow to ski, I'm going to stay off the snow. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's kind of wild that you can, you know, handle these different slopes fully on skis. I've never done cross country skiing, but it sounds, it sounds just like that, right? Uh, well, um, cross country skiing, you don't have, you don't have the sustained slopes. Like you might have some rolls, like typical cross country ski courses are more or less flat, maybe a little rolly, but more or less flat with Alpine touring. You're, you're gaining a lot of elevation and the goal is to rip the skins and then ski down Alpine style and mm -hmm. bind it. The skis are different than cross country skis. The bindings are different. It's a totally different ski setup with Alpine touring versus cross country skiing because you're skiing different types of terrain. And especially in Utah where you can ski pretty much anything in powder, um, you know, it makes sense to have like a bigger, wider, uh, more Alpine style ski just with a different binding so that you can tour to access that powder. Yeah, that makes sense. Is there, is there any other gear that you like that's unique to Alpine skiing? Yeah. So, uh, well, so Alpine skiing, I will call Alpine skiing, like what you see at the resort, like where you have these really, you really like thick, durable, stiff boots, you know, of a specific type of binding meant that meant specifically for like charging downhill and typically the skis are heavier with Alpine touring. Um, you know, that's just that's just another word for backcountry skiing, but it's not, you know, you can use a touring setup in the resort if you want, or you know, some resorts allow people to skin up and skin up and ski down inbounds. They have a specific route you can do that. Um, but alpine touring, so the skis are usually lighter. Now some people will take like a, a like a an alpine ski and just slap a touring setup on it. That's what I did my first year here. Um, but as you get fitter and as you become a more ambitious skier the natural move is to gradually decrease the weight in what's on your feet so my first season here i had the ski my setup was the salmon qst 106 that's a uh an alpine ski um it's it's fairly heavy like 2100 grams um and i had the salmon shift binding so that's a hybrid binding where it's a it's a full alpine binding but the it, the it, you can modify it to work for touring um and then i had salomon shift pro boots and that's like kind of similar it's like it, it's it's basically a glorified resort boot like it's a full-size resort boot but it has the ability to tour and so i had a very heavy setup my first year here and that's because i, th I thought i was going to do mostly uh inbound skiing and you know some ski touring and that's a great setup for that well i ended up doing mostly ski touring and some inbound skiing so the next season i 
um, went to slightly lighter skis, uh, a very specific touring binding, um, and I, I switched to a lighter boot. And the you know the the there's pros and cons to everything. So lighter, less weight on my feet means more efficient uphill. Um, but it also will decrease the downhill performance. Like you really want that like beefy setup on your feet to maximize your downhill performance, especially if the snow is variable. Um, so touring setups will always be less uh, less good for the for downhill skiing than a than a than an alpine ski setup. Um, but as you become a better skier, you can sort of like offset that. Um, as, as I've noticed year over year, as I improve my downhill skiing, I don't even like think about, um, the difference between what I am skiing with now versus what I skied with three years ago, because I'm, I'm a much better skier than I was three years ago. So long story short, if you're an ambitious backcountry skier, or, or even if you just want a dedicated touring setup, you're going to want something that's, that's lighter and more functional for the uphill, especially if you're skiing powder. Um, Anybody can ski powder well on pretty much any setup. It's when the snow gets variable where it pays to have a beefier setup on your feet um, for the downhill. Um, but that's not necessarily what people come to Utah for if they're backcountry skiing. They're trying to find something on track to ski. Um, but yeah, does, does that answer that question? Yeah, yeah, it does. And I guess is there any any like special gear that you're carrying on the upper half of you? I I mean I assume it's like avalanche safety. And... Yeah, the way I look at it is, it pays to be strong, and so I can take more weight on my feet. And then in my pack, I carry a lot of stuff. So I have a 37 liter pack, and I don't always fill it to the brim, but um, I I carry a variety of, of different layers. So like I'm wearing a like a wool base layer right now because I'm gonna go skiing after this conversation, um. So like I'll wear some base layer and soft shell pants, and then in my pack um, I'll carry a puffy jacket, a soft shell jacket, and a hard shell jacket, depending on the conditions I find or what I expect. And then I carry um, a lot of fluids. So I have like like a one liter insulated water bottle. So if it's really cold out, you want an insulated water bottle so your water doesn't freeze, so you can stay hydrated. And <laughs> I also will bring a, a one liter jug of Fairlife chocolate milk if I'm doing a really big touring day because uh, it's just more efficient calories. You could, I mean, it takes up a lot of space. So that's not that efficient. But like if I'm taking a break after a ski run and I don't want to like waste too many minutes chewing food, just take a couple swigs of chocolate milk and then be on my way. Um, so I like, I, I think that's kind of funny because I think I might be the only skier in Salt Lake who will bring an entire jug of chocolate milk into the backcountry. But uh, it's just, <laughs> so, you know, I, that, those two things are a lot of weight. Like fluids do not, are not light. Um, and then depending on how big of a day I'm doing, I'll have some, some solid food as well. Usually like granola bars or a protein bar or something. And, and I usually just keep those in reserve if I run out of a chocolate milk. <laughs> The, you know, just depending on how big the day is, you know, pretty much three types of jackets, three types of gloves, a lot of fluids and food. Um, I always carry a first aid kit, um, sunglasses, goggles, sunscreen, those things. And then your avalanche rescue equipment, um, a beacon, shovel, and a probe. Um, you know, you sh I, I pretty much, that lives in my backpack. I almost never take it out. Uh, because even if you're not in avalanche terrain, it's, it's just a good thing to have. Like maybe, you know, maybe you're skiing a, near an avalanche slope where you can see the avalanche slope. And if you see somebody get caught in a slide, you know, it, you know, it's good to have the equipment so that you can go and help with a rescue if in that sort of situation. So the avalanche rescue stuff, um, the, the shovel and the probe lives in my pack. Um, and then if, if I'm skiing avalanche train, I'm wearing the beacon, um, you know, people will say you should always wear the beacon even if you're not skiing an avalanche train. I don't do that. Like, um, if I'm, you know, like, for example, early season, I'm just skinning up and down the groomer at Alta. Um, you know, I, I haven't been wearing the beacon. You know, some people do. It's generally good practice to wear the beacon. You know, you just, you never know what will happen. But if I'm not wearing the beacon, if I'm not skiing avalanche train, it does live in my backpack. Like, that's always there. Um, I don't think I've missed any any of the important things that are in my pack but long story short i'm not one that 
packs light. I like to have more things than I think I'll need. Um, I also am kind of like a calorie machine. Like I need a lot of fluids. I need a lot of food because I overheat like an old car. So uh, I, you know, I just, I, you know, I, I carry a lot of stuff in the back country and, but being strong, being physically strong pays because I can still do those big days with all that weight and it doesn't destroy me. Um, but you know, some people will not carry all that stuff. That's fine. That's their choice. Um, but I don't, I don't mind carrying the extra weight. So I just, I just choose to have those things. Yeah. One of the things you brought up, uh, when you're going through that is like, there are, you kind of got the sliding scale if you're doing alpine skiing or what do you call it, alpine backcountry. Um, it, you're just kind of negotiating that weight versus the, um, I don't even know. It's, it's like a weight scale. Um, one thing that I'm finding is I interview some of these different guests that are doing some of these unique sports. Uh, gear is kind of hard to get a hold of because, you know, backcountry skiing, I imagine, is a is a pretty niche area of skiing. Most people go to the resorts or they do um, slalom, not, not slalom. Uh, damn, I'm blanking. Uh, Cross-country skiing. Uh, is Is it the same with with backcountry skiing where you have to kind of go to specific retailers to, to find this stuff? Not in Salt Lake. I mean, Salt Lake is the backcountry ski capital of the world. Okay. There is a huge backcountry ski community here. There's tons of, all of the outdoorsy shops um, have all of the things you could need in the backcountry. It, it, it's actually, I, I saw some statistics on this, but it's one of the fastest growing sports in the world is backcountry skiing. Wow. And, you know, I think COVID, really impacted that you know the resorts closed people still wanted to ski so they bought touring gear and they went out into the backcountry when the resorts were closed and um you know there's a lot of outdoor influencers that have opened up this world of backcountry skiing to the to the world um you know i think cody townsend's 50 project is a huge influence on a lot of people getting into backcountry skiing um and that, that there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's great. It, you know, that had an impact on me, but, um, it's the, the secret is out. It's, it's not a secret anymore that that country skiing is awesome. And, uh, it's not hard to find the gear, at least not in Salt Lake or any mountain town in the West. You'll have no issue finding shops that have that, all the gear you might need. Um, I, I don't, you know, it might be a little more difficult to find in the East Coast or and definitely more difficult to find in the Midwest. But, um, you know, any like big mountain destination, you, like it's there's going to be a backcountry ski community. It's not as niche as you might think um, when you spend your time in that environment, uh, especially in North America and Europe. Um, there's just such easy access to backcountry skiing um, that, you know, it's 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 quite popular kind of across the board. I'm glad you mentioned the the secrets out. I mean, that's something I'm finding very common with all these episodes is like the social media aspect of things really makes it easy to approach a lot of this stuff. So, you know, you can find that it exists and then kind of do some preliminary research and, and get started with it. Uh, yep. And 10 years ago, I mean, 20 years ago, we didn't have GPSs or anything. So all these sports are evolving so much. Uh, yeah. And, you know, people are finding about crazy ultra marathons or canoe races or, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's it's really cool. Uh, yeah, so so from here, I mean, so what's on your mind now, right? You have progressed so far in this thing. I You're to the point where you don't even buy a ski pass anymore. And, like, I have to imagine that you have some goals in mind or, or things that you want to achieve in the next five, ten years. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean... I, uh, the thing with like big mountain skiing and ski mountaineering is you can never be totally married to the idea of skiing a specific line. Ultimately you ski with the mountains, let you ski. And I, um, I'm, you know, I have a tendency to cherry pick my weather windows. So I don't find my, I haven't found myself in a lot of situations where the mountain has told me to turn around or, or do something different, but it will happen. To where I might travel to uh, to try to climb and ski something and the conditions are just not there. The weather is just not there. Um, so like I have goals, but you, you just don't know until you go give it a try. Um, 
so like ultimately i you know you may know this about people in the midwest they're kind of homebodies like people in the midwest don't travel a ton and i'm trying to not be so much of a homebody so i have a personal goal of visiting one new to me country every year they're either um, homebodies I, or they'll drive everywhere <laughs> yeah 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 um I have a personal goal of visiting one new to me country every year. And I want skiing to be my reason to go do that. And ultimately, hopefully try to climb and ski a cool mountain. Um, I may not achieve that goal this year. Uh, you know, this year, I mean, I was studying for an actuarial exam all fall. I tried to put together a New Zealand ski trip last minute. Didn't really work out. And, um, I wasn't going to travel all the way to New Zealand and not have any ski partners and then be twiddling my thumbs in Mount Cook Village during weather window to try to climb and ski Mount Cook. So I didn't end up going. And I don't know if I'll make it to a new to me country this year because, you know, last ski season I, I was skiing in Utah and, and the Tetons and, and the Pacific Northwest. And I had a good time. I had a great season. Um, but uh, I was supposed to go to Denali and then that trip fell apart. And what I should have done is go to Chamonix. They had the most incredible spring ever there, and I didn't. So kind of missed opportunity there. But long story short, because I didn't do really any traveling this year, and I've also been managing some injuries most of this year, I've, I've saved up a lot of vacation time at work, which I can carry over a lot of it into next year. So I do plan on doing a lot of traveling next year. And, you know, ultimately what I end up being able to climb and ski just depends on the conditions and the weather. But, um, you know, I guess over the next couple of years, hopefully some of it next year, but like I'd like to climb and ski Mont Blanc. Uh, there's a few lines on Mont Blanc that have sort of been, you know, living in my mind rent free for the past couple of years. Um, since the New Zealand trip didn't happen this year, I'm, I'm fairly committed to going to New Zealand next October. So October in the Southern Hemisphere is the equivalent of our April. So that's like peak ski mountaineering month is like in the Northern Hemisphere, like April, May, even into June sometimes in the Southern Hemisphere, like way down in South America, like Argent, like the Patagonia area in Argentina and Chile or New Zealand, the Southern Alps, like their peak season is like middle of October. So I'm fairly committed to going down there next fall because um, it didn't happen this year. And, you know, the Southern Alps have some pretty remarkable terrain. Um, down the road at some point, I'd like to climb and ski Denali. Um, that was supposed to happen this year and it didn't. And my motivation for Denali is, is not as high as it was. Um, someday I'll do it. I just, I just don't know when, probably in the next five years, but I don't think it's going to be next year. Um, and I've been thinking like, you know, in maybe three or four years, I'd like to get back into some of the higher altitude stuff. Uh, maybe, you know, ski a 7,000 meter peak in the Himalaya. And then if, if I enjoy that experience, maybe maybe try to do an 8,000 meter peak. But that's a big maybe. I mean, it, it, those really high altitude peaks are uh, just a different animal. I climbed and ski Chimborazo um, last December, which is a 20,600 foot peak. Um, and that was a that was a cool experience, but you know I felt strong until I didn't. And at like six thousand meters altitude, it was it destroyed me. And so the thought of going another thousand meters higher than that, or another you know two thousand meters higher than that, um, you know we'll see we'll see about that. But um, ultimately, you know I want to use skiing as my reason to see different parts of the world because I didn't grow up traveling a lot, um, and you know I don't. I don't have a family, like I don't have a whole lot of responsibilities in this season of life. So as long as that is still the case, I'd like to really take advantage of, you know, my young adult years and, and, you know, travel around different parts of the world with my skis. That's what a lot of people are doing with the guests I have on here. They, they use their sport, their hobby, and it consumes them, right? It takes them everywhere. There's a guy I had on who does canoe racing. He lives in Texas and he flies into, into Michigan every year to do this canoe marathon. And he's been over to Europe to do it. So I just mm -hmm. think that's really cool that people latch onto these hobbies and use their, uh, you know, their unique talents to see the world in ways that people never get to see it, right? You yeah, with outdoor, with, outdoor, with outdoor sports, 
pretty much no matter what the sport is, you can use that sport as your reason to go to see different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Like avid cyclists, um, you know, there's like great cycling in Portugal and Spain. And I like I have people that I follow on Strava and I'm like they're going to, you know, into Europe to go on a cycling trip or maybe they go to um, do like a, a bike packing trip in South America or something like that. Like um, with skiing, there's great mountain ranges all over the world. I do think North America has the best skiing in the world, but uh, it doesn't mean you should just stay in North America, like take the skis and go see other places. Um, or climbing, like there's climbing it, literally on every continent you can find world-class climbing. Um, and then like ultra running, like it, it's all like all those outdoorsy things, surfing, you know, there's great surfing on every continent. So um, that's like my personal life goal is to see the world with skis. Um, and, you know, but, you know, I have, I have other things in life that I'm passionate about and, and we'll see. Um, I've definitely not, not found anything that, um, has really consumed me the way backcountry skiing has in like, I've had, a, I, I've, I've, I always have a passion that I'm pretty obsessed with pretty much my entire life. I listed some of the things I was really into when I was younger and nothing has been like, as like addictively consuming to me as, as backcountry skiing. <laughs> I'm curious why you, why you think that North America has the best skiing in the world. Um, the mountain ranges in Western North America pretty much have the most reliable snowfall conditions. Okay. Um, even in a bad season, you'll, you'll be able to find some ranges that are, are having good conditions. Um, the, the powder skiing that you can find in North America, whether it be, you know, coastal Alaska down into British Columbia, all the way down through Utah into New Mexico. I mean, like the ability to ski incredible powder conditions all across all, all the way down North America. You, you don't find that as reliably in other parts of the world, like the Alps, you, you, like you, you don't find the powder skiing, that kind of powder skiing in the Alps. You definitely don't find it in New Zealand. Um, not saying you can't have a good powder day in, in those areas, but it's not as reliable as what you find in North America. Um, but I, I mean, technically, Japan is like the really the place you go for powder skiing. But when you combine the conditions also with the, the variety of terrain. I think North America has like it has something for everybody, um, no matter what your skill level or ambition level is. Um, our, our our mountain ranges are just I don't know. There's something different about them. Um Granted, you know, if you were talking to somebody who was born and raised in, in skis in Chamonix, they'll probably tell me I'm full of shit. But um, <laughs> I've heard from people that you do not get, like, the, the reliable powder skiing um, in most other parts of the world, combined with, like, you know, dramatic big mountain terrain. Um, but I need to go see those parts of the world to see for myself if that's true. Oh, well check in with you in a few years and have you report back. I always try to leave time at the end of the episode to just let people tell stories, like type two fun stories or, you know, their shitty experiences that they always talk about with their friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if any come to mind, but I'd love to hear about one or many. Yeah, I, I can, I definitely have a couple stories from my, my first couple ski tours. Um, so my first ski tour ever was at the Killington uphill route, um, their inbounds touring route that they have. And it's a 1200 foot climb to the top of this run. And I, you know, this is February of 2021, I want to say. And, you know, I've always been a fit person, but, you know, like it takes, you know, some time and training to get used to climbing uphill with all the weight that you, all the extra weight that you have with, ski, with backcountry skiing and, you have to learn the technique and everything, but I did four laps of this 1200 foot route. So 4,800 feet for your first ever ski tour is, is not small. That's not a small amount of elevation gain. And I was so mangled at the end of that first ski tour I did. I think a normal person would have been like, screw this, like this sucks. But I had already decided in my mind that that spring I was going to try to climb in ski Mount Shasta, which is a 7,200 foot climb from the trailhead to the summit and, and i was just thinking like i gotta get in better shape like i gotta, I gotta get better at this because i'm gonna go climb in ski mount shasta and uh i did not climb in ski mount shasta that year i did two years later in, in 2023 um 
but uh so it's it's just kind of funny that like i bit off way more than i could chew for that first ever ski tour um and my you know the way i i'm wired is when i, when I set my mind to something you know even if i have a terrible experience i'd be like all right gotta get better at this <laughs> like um and then my first ever ski tour here at alta um, I, you know, it was my first week living in Utah. I drove up to Alta, you know, Alta had closed for the season. This is late April. And I was going to go up to the top of Mount Baldy to ski main shoot at Alta. And I met a couple of people there, um, who told me they would, you know, I could tag along with them on the way up and, and, and ski with them on the way down. And, uh, you know, I had, you know, my first real touring setup and which I don't have anymore. I broke one of the skis. The other ski is going to turn into a shot ski. But um, so I had this touring setup, which the skins were cut for the this 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 setup. And but that day I brought a different pair of skis, the Salmon QST 106s, and those are much wider skis. You absolutely have to have skins that are cut specifically for the ski that you're using, because if they're too narrow and you have too much ski edge exposed, when you're skinning up a steep slope you're 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 gonna slide on your edge because the skin isn't isn't fighting. And I found out I found that out on the baldy shoulder and I could I was just slipping like crazy. I could not make any progress uphill, you know, this last thousand feet to the top of Mount Baldy. Um and those those two people sort of pulled away from me, but they, they were gracious enough to wait for me at main shoot. But it got to the point where I was just like I was full on epicking at mount baldy at alta utah so i just like t i stopped skinning i i put the skis on the pack and i boot packed through like waist deep snow to get up to the top of main chute uh and i was completely destroyed and it's only a 2300 foot climb from the parking lot to the top of main chute and i was completely destroyed um you know and i got to the top and we skied and it, and it was great and it was fun but uh it's just like it's so funny to look back on because I'm, I'm fairly dialed with my gear now. Um, and, and I, I moved through the mountains pretty efficiently now, um, you know, with those th three years of experience since then, but, uh, to look back on like those early days of ski touring and learning things the hard way. Um, it's, it's just like, it's just funny. Like, I feel like everybody has that sort of experience where you, you there's what this one little thing you don't know about and you, 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 you really should, and, and you find out the hard way and you have an epic when you shouldn't have to have an epic. Um, yeah. So those were some of the funny early days of, of backcountry skiing that I think a normal person would be like, screw this, this sucks. And I was just like, I got to figure out how to get better at this. <laughs> yeah. You got to have those failures to kind of know what you need to improve on. I, I, I firmly believe that with everything in life, with relationships, with work, with, you know, your academics, your fitness, like, I don't know, messing up is a part of this, a part of the fun and just like growing from it. Uh, I, again, I have never done hiking in the snow, so I can just imagine how frustrating that would be just sinking down to your waist with every single step, trying to get to this peak that you. The funny thing you know, is I shouldn't have had to be boot packing through that deep, soft snow. I, you know, if I would have known better, I would have had skins specifically for the skis uh, that I was using that day and I would have had no problem getting up, but I did not know how much of a difference it makes. You, like you cannot climb up steep slopes like that when the skins are too narrow for your skis. And, uh, you know, it's, it is what it is. I know I, I've not had to, I've not had that experience since the first thing I did after that day was buy another pair of skins for those skis. <laughs> awesome. Lesson learned. Well, this has been great. I mean, do you want to go ahead and give, unless you have any closing thoughts, like, do you want to give shout outs and, uh, like tell people where they can find you? Um, yeah. Uh, you can find me on, uh, I mean, I'm most active on Instagram. Um, my first name dot last name. So Seamus S E A M U S dot Dolan D O L A N. Um, you know, the, you know, if you just Google my name or not Google, if you just look at my name on YouTube, you'll probably find that too. I, uh, you know, I don't know how active I'll be with the YouTube this ski season. Like I'll, I'll post little clips, but, um, it's, uh, you know, as I, you know, sort of mature as a backcountry skier, I, I've been doing a lot of thinking about, um, sort of, my approach towards social media because like mm -hmm. i'm not getting paid 
to post anything. Um, not, not that there's not that many people that follow me. So, um, you know, I, basically what it'll, that'll probably look like is just posting POV videos of, you know, great ski runs and, and not necessarily, um, making like a blog about it. Uh, and, but you can also find that on my Instagram. Like, um, I definitely post a lot more there. Um, as far as shout outs, I mean, my roommate Scott's been a great ski partner to me and a mentor. Um, you, you know, he, you, you, you'll see him on my Instagram a lot if you want to follow him. Um, a friend of mine named Nate Bayer, um, who I met my first full season here, was a great mentor to me. And I've learned a lot from him. You know, he spent a decade skiing in Colorado um, before moving to Utah. So, you know, I really trust his decision making in, in Avalanche Train, especially when the conditions are questionable. And I learned a lot skiing with him, you know, my first couple seasons here. And I might I might ski with him tomorrow, actually. Um, yeah, those two people are, you know, my, my buddy Sebastian's been a really fun partner to ski with. I met him this year and um, I'll probably ski with him this afternoon. And uh, we're going to be chatting about our, our goals for the season. Um, yeah, those 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 three people really stick out as, as people I'm, um, you know, have definitely played a big role especially in the last couple of years um, as, as partners, me in the mountains. Uh, yeah. And I, I just want to ask, like, if this is something that anybody wanted to get started in, like, how would you recommend they go about doing that in a few sentences? Yeah. Well, I mean, buy your first touring setup and then go to the resorts that allow uphill skiing to, to their uphill routes and, and, and start there because um, you know, that was my first experience and the nice thing, especially if you are in a, like the mountain West of the U S or even Canada, um, where there is, there's always going to be a backcountry ski community in any mountain town. You know, if you start at the resorts, you're going to meet people who are doing the same thing. Um, and you know, you can, you can make those first connections there, um, and, and you know, find your first backcountry ski partners, um, so that, you know, I think is the best way for people to start. Um, as far as like avalanche courses, you know, some people will say you should take your level one like immediately before you start backcountry skiing. I don't a hundred percent agree with that. I think it's actually good to get some ski touring experience. And, you know, if you can find somebody who is experienced to ski in the backcountry a little bit, maybe not an avalanche train or, or maybe an avalanche train if the danger is low, you know, I think it is good to get that experience to decide if you even like backcountry skiing and if you want to push it into avalanche terrain before you take an avalanche course. Um, because like the level one is more or less designed to scare you out of avalanche terrain. Okay. So if, you know, I think you should decide whether or not you want to ski avalanche terrain to begin with before you, you go down that path. Um, but uh, regardless, you know, starting at the ski resorts is a great way to meet people. Um, if you're going to take an avalanche course right away, I would personally recommend the avalanche rescue course. Pretty much, you, you know, if you just Google avalanche rescue course, um, you, you can find somebody that offers it in almost any mountain town. And even if you don't aspire to ski an avalanche train, it's good to have the knowledge of how to be helpful if somebody does get buried in an avalanche. Um, so, you know, I'd say the, those are the, the main things I would say for somebody who maybe hasn't dipped their toes into it yet, but is thinking about it or wants to, um, at ski resorts, you could go up, you could just boot pack up with your skis in your back. You know, I, if you, if you don't have a touring setup, I don't think that's a very enjoyable experience or you could take snowshoes. Um, but, uh, you know, that's definitely where to go to make those first connections. I like that. I think that's like really actionable and something that anybody can do. I mean, I didn't even know that there were like, you know, backcountry areas on every ski hill. So just knowing Not that every you know, ski hill allows ski touring, but most do nowadays. Okay. Um, you know, like here in Utah, Solitude and Brighton and Park City all have uphill ski routes. Uh, I don't think snow Snowbird and Alta definitely do not. I don't think Deer Valley does. Um, I think Snow Basin does. Um, and then I don't know about uh, Sundance does not. I don't know about uh, Beaver Mountain and I don't know the status on, of Brian Head. But, um, you know, if you just look, if you just go to 
a ski resort's website and in their search function just um just put in uphill you can find a page if, if they allow uphill ski skinning at the resort you know what hours of the day they allow that what the route um is that you can do that um most resort websites have that on their website okay awesome well seamus this has been a great time i hope you had fun and uh yeah, thanks for coming on yeah thanks tyler have a great weekend Thanks for listening to the Type 2 Fun Podcast. If you like this episode, we have another episode on your screen which talks about avalanche safety and other mountaineering adventures that we think you might like. Uh, Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.